So welcome all to the Intellectual Forum this evening with Think Lab, and we're here with Giles. Tyler, do you want to hand over? Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, we're really happy to have Giles talk about the, uh, the truth about diets, and we're co-hosting uh, this event with the Jesus College Intellectual Forum and the uh, Cambridge University Think Lab. So we're going to be um, uh, keep an eye on our, uh, we'll be available on Twitter, and we'll be doing a few tweets during this event at Think Lab Cam. And uh, we have a few events um, coming up. So we've got the, uh, the Social Dilemma um, documentary through Netflix. Some of you might have seen it. We're going to talk about digital well-being. Um, we've just confirmed um, that we'll have the executive producer from The Simpsons, Al Jean, join us in January. So that should be kind of fun, talking about American politics. Um, it's been an eventful uh, week. Week, what am I talking about? It's been an eventful four years in American politics. So um, like we'll have a lot to talk about. So keep an eye on that. And... Um, I think I will do a very brief introduction for Giles and then let him talk. Um, Giles Yeo is uh, based at the uh, University of Cambridge Institute of Metabolic Science. Um, he's got over 20 years of experience in um, studying the genetics of obesity and brain control. And um, he was recently uh, awarded an MBE in the Queen's uh, 2020 birthday honors. Um, so uh, that was, uh, that was uh, quite a feather in his cap. And uh, his recent uh, book, his best-selling book, which uh, I'm actually reading right now, um, uh, Gene Eating, The uh, Story of Human Appetite, uh, it's interesting. So uh, Giles did not pay me to give that plug. I just wanted to uh, share that necessary uh, that, that bit of information. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, that's a good segue. So I think we'll turn it over to Giles now and let him talk about the truth about diets. So welcome, Giles. Hello, thank you so much for inviting me. Let me just share my screen as everyone is now um, used to these things. Um, there we go. And, um, and I'm very grateful to the Intellectual um, um, Forum for hosting me. And, and it's always, oh, actually, let me turn on the, let me turn on the, the, the program. Um, it's, I, I do, I always appreciate whenever I give these talks, um, I always appreciate that you are risking me. You, you, you are risking yourself by giving me this platform. Ha, ha, ha. No, that's not true. But, but in, in, in reality, I am really grateful for, for the platform, and I hope that I won't um, disappoint anybody. And I'm here to talk about diets today. So, um, like I said, my name is Giles Yeo. I'm a geneticist by trade, and I work down at Adam Brooks Hospital, uh, the, the Cambridge Biomedical Campus, um, where I study the brain control of food intake. Okay? And but what I began, and, and also the, the variation in response of different people to the food environment we live in. So why some people are small, medium, large in this kind of environment that, 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 that we live in. So that's my day job. That's what I teach here. That's what I research. That's what I publish on, broad, broad, broadly speaking. But I think everyone within the field of, um, well, I'd say everyone within the field, I think it's becoming clear the vast majority of non-communicable diseases in the world we face today, we have a communicable disease issue at the moment, but the vast majority of non-communicable diseases are diet related, okay? And so there is an issue to, to, to actually face. And I studied the biological variation on the one hand, but also realize that if we don't fix the environment that we're actually living in, that we can't, we won't be able to sustainably actually fix, fix the problem. And so I got into um, being interested in elements of the environment of which diets are one of them. And this is what we're gonna be talking about today. Now diets are an interesting term. Whenever we speak about diets now, uh, um, you know, our face scrunches up, you know, we're talking, it, it, it's, to my mind, when you say I am going on a diet, it, it has a, well, I like to think it has a toxic ring to it. You know, people scrunch up their face. People are fearful of diets. People, people don't know what to say about diets. People are evangelical about diets. It's all very, very um, um, aggressive. And, and, but it had such a wonderful beginning. So diet actually comes from the Greek word dieta, um, which means a way of life. And come on, what a beautiful term that is. Because why? Because food should be a way of life. Yet we're here and talking about about fear. And, um, and so look, there are many, many different reasons why people go on, on, on diets, okay? Um, maybe you've just been diagnosed with uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Maybe you've got hypertension, high blood pressure. Maybe you've just uh, uh, been, become a type two diabetic. Many reasons. But for the vast majority of people, when they say, I'm going on a diet, I'm going on a diet, I need a diet. You're talking about losing weight, broadly speaking, okay? Now, the problem with losing weight is that it's difficult. 
okay? And, uh, and we'll get to that in, in, in a second. And because it's difficult and different people try and push different diets, there is now a whole emporium, a proliferation of different diets that, that, that are out there. And I've kind of listed just some of them. And all of these I actually handled to some degree um, in, 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 in the book, this diet emporium. And I became interested in actually trying to understand these, these diets and whether or not they work. Now, there are some diets here which are entirely, for lack of a better term, BS. And, and really have no basis uh, in, in function at all. And I won't talk about this because this is the University of Cambridge after all, and you guys are here to actually find out about things that work. And the big surprising thing, to me at least, um, is when I was researching all of these diets, is that the vast majority of them actually do work for at least some people and for at least for a short period of time. It's just very, very rarely for the explanation that is sold on the side of the tin or in the PR brochure or on their website, okay? And, um, and as it turns out, there are actually some very, very uh, simple principles about how most diets work and we're, gonna, uh, and we're actually gonna get to that. And so that's what this talk is about. This talk is about the truth about diets and, and I'm not gonna go painfully into each one of these, but how they actually, the ones that work, how they actually um, how they actually work. Now, when I was hawking this book, uh, uh, um, you know, walking around and actually uh, speaking to publishers about, about getting the book published, you know, I'd obviously sent samples. All of the, the publishers asked the, uh, the same question. Okay, all of them did. Where is your plan? I'm going like, what plan? Your plan, your yo plan, like the diet plan. I said, did you read the book? Did you read the book? There is no plan. And there is no universal plan because all of us are different and all of us respond differently. And so there is no magical single diet that actually suits all. That being said, oh, oh sorry. And, and so this is the, the book which I was trying to sell. It's called uh, uh, Gene Eating. And it's a story of, of, of human appetite, really. But as I was putting together the book and as I was, as I was writing it, I began to realize that while I didn't have a plan per se, that a number of things emerged, a number of truths emerged, okay? And because they were based on some biological grounding and some biological fact, they were by definition not fatty. And I have rather, and I found six of them, and I have rather narcissistically called them yo truths, but we leave that alone, okay? It's like a, sort of like a pastiche on, 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 on my diet plan, and there are six of them. And I've I have structured this talk as such. Well, I'm going to go through one to six. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on some than others. Don't worry, I'm not going to bang on for, for, forever uh, about my truths. And then you see if you buy my argument at the end. If not, you can huck your shoe at me and, and, and we'll see how we, how we go. Okay? So let's go to number one. As I said, when we're talking about diets, we're talking about losing weight. And do you know what the problem is? It ain't easy. Okay? Yo truth number one, it ain't supposed to be easy. So look, I am a geneticist by trade, as I said, and um, I think of being a geneticist is a perfectly upstanding thing to do. My mother-in-law still speaks to me. So this is, these are all good things. But when people ask me what I study, what disease, what trait I study, and I say body weight, and I say obesity, which sits on one end of the spectrum of body weight, I immediately become the bad person. And I become the bad person because I'm perceived as giving fat people, overweight people, people living with obesity, terms I do not use in a pejorative fashion whatsoever, an excuse. Um, which philosophically to me has always been an interesting take on it. Because if I was studying the genetics of dementia, the genetics of cancer, the genetics of rheumatoid arthritis, and any other disease that, 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 that was out there, would I suddenly be giving those people suffering from those diseases an excuse? No, I'd be trying to understand biology. God forbid I'd be trying to help someone. But yet when we talk about body weight, obesity in particular, suddenly it's this issue of you're just giving people a crush. You're just giving people an excuse. And do you know why? This is the reason why. So all of us have seen these scales of justice things um, um, uh, of, in its different guises. And this is in effect, the first law of thermodynamics, okay? So you can't magic calories into your body and you certainly can't magic the calories away. You have to eat more than you burn in order to gain weight, you have to. And ergo, the only way to lose weight is to burn more than you eat. And you guys are thinking, hang on a second, did he just really just say eat less and move more is the answer? 
I did. And, and the, the reason behind that is because it's physics. So it's true. How you get to the body weight you are is going to be down to physics. But, and this is about to, to stop adding me, okay? This is the real but. The but here is how is not the right question to ask. The question is why? Why do people behave so differently around food? Why? Why do some people respond to stress by eating? Why do some people respond to stress by not eating? It's the same hormone. It's cortisol. Why does diametrically uh, uh, oppose opposites? Why do some people prefer to comfort eat and others not? Why do some people prefer salty versus, versus fatty food? Why do some people prefer sweet foods? There's a whole host of questions about our way that we actually behave around food. The key thing here is the way we behave. Why are some people hungrier than others? Why do some people use food as fuel? The way we behave around food influences the physics. And the biological variation lies in the why. The how is simply how we actually get there. The how is about the physics. And when we talk about biological variation, we have to talk about genetics because after all, it's your genes that, um, that, that really influence your, 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 your biology. And when geneticists, um, one of the powerful tools that geneticists have used are twin studies, okay? And, and this is one of the tools we have used in order to unpick elements of the genetics un underlying body weight. So why twins? I'll just briefly praise it so everyone's on the same on, on the same level. Clearly, you have identical twins and you have non-identical twins. And identical twins are genetic clones of each other. You share all of your genetic material. And non-identical twins would share as much material as you would with your own sibling or for that matter, your parents, 50%, okay? So you could take any given human trait and ask the question, well, what happens, and, and study enough twins and ask the question, well, what happens when you share all of your genes versus what happens when you share half of your genes and then be able to measure the heritability of a given trait. So the percentage of a trait that's gonna be down to your genes versus down to, the, versus down to the environment. Let me give you a couple of examples. So if I had hair, my hair would be black. Now hair color, I wanna argue, is very powerfully genetically influenced with very little environmental impact. Coloring your hair does not count. I'm talking about natural hair color, okay? So there's a powerfully genetically influenced trait. Um, let's take a look at another example, freckles. Now, freckles are clearly also going to have a genetic influence, but whether or not they appear, how many appear, even amongst identical twins, would entirely depend on whether or not you wear T-shirts. Do I like to stand in the sun? So there's a classic example of a genetically influenced trait, powerfully genetically influenced trait, but with an equally powerful environmental impact. As it turns out, every single human trait every single human trait and behavior will have a genetic influence. The trick is to try and figure out the role of the environment in all of this. And in very many ways, looking at your genes is the easiest thing because it's static. It's static, it doesn't change. You can just, you measure it the day you're born to the day you die, it doesn't change, right? Whereas the environment is volatile, it changes all through your life. So it's very, very, very difficult to actually make that, that, that measurement. So when you do that math, then the heritability of body weight is actually 70%. So it's certainly not zero. It's not 100% though. Um, so to give some perspective, the heritability of height, which I think that everyone here would agree is genetic, okay? Um, it's certainly approaching that. Um, it's certainly approaching that of height. So what do some of these genes, what do some of these genes do? Are they down to one gene? It's not going to be down to one gene. So we now have a general schema of, um, which is what I study, of how the brain controls food intake, okay? And so your brain needs two pieces of information, two pieces of information in order to control your food intake. It needs to know, first of all, how much fat you have. And this is an important piece of information because how much fat you have is how long you would last in the wild without any food. If your food stopped today, how long would you survive, okay? Not a problem today, clearly, but a problem in the past where we never had enough food. Okay, so this is an important integer to hold in your head. Second piece of information, which we will come back in more detail, is your brain needs to know what you're currently eating and what you have just eaten. So these are now your short-term signals. And these are going to come, these signals are going to come from your gastrointestinal tract, your gut, your gut, your stomach, okay, um, um, through hormones. So what happens is your brain senses these short and long-term signals, Okay, the fat and what you've eaten, and then influences your next interaction with a restaurant, uh, uh, with a menu, and with your fridge. 
Now, there are, as I said, genetic modifiers that run throughout this process. So when you ask, well, okay, when you're talking about the why, okay, some people eat more than others. Well, what do some of these genes do? Okay, well, now I can't tell you about every single gene, but we know what some of them do do. So for example, some of the genes influence the sensitivity of your brain to the signals coming from your fat. Okay, so for example, if I were carrying 20 kilos of fat, just, just as an example, and so there are going to be hormones circulating in my blood, which signal to my brain 20 kilos of fat. But imagine if my brain was slightly less sensitive, but was only sensing 18 kilos of fat. What does it do? It's beginning to say 18, 18, I thought I had 20. And so what it does, your brain begins to drive you to eat more to get to 20 kilos of fat, except you already have 20 kilos of fat. So what does that mean? You end up being larger than someone else because you're eating more. Another example, imagine you've had a thousand calories for dinner, okay? But your brain is slightly less sensitive to the signals and only senses 900 calories. It, you see where I'm going with here it then drives you to eat more, which is why, and these are just some of the genes, which is why in a given scenario where you and your partner, your boyfriend, your wife, your husband, whoever, okay, is across the table from each other and eat exactly the same meal, exactly the same meal, but yet one of you can be fuller than someone else, one of you can finish the food faster, one of you can be, be hungrier than, than, than someone else, even eating exactly the same meal. For some people, it's always gonna be more difficult to stop eating and to say no to food because of your genes. And actually, no matter how skinny you are, no matter how many packs or six packs, I have a one pack that, 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 that you have, if you lose weight, your brain hates it. If you lose any weight, why does your brain hate it? Your brain hates it because it considers weight loss as reducing your chances of survival. So it starts waving a big flag going, ar, 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 and it makes it difficult. It ain't easy to lose weight because it ain't supposed to be easy. Your brain makes it not easy. Your truth number two, eat a little less of everything. This is otherwise known as moderation. Now you see, this is the kind of advice that's not gonna make me any money, okay? But that's okay because it's true. Now the problem with moderation is two things that I find. First, it's boring. It is really, okay? It's not very exciting at all. Um, and second, it's actually quite difficult. So let me give you an example. For whatever reason known to, to, to humankind, the portion size of pasta, dried pasta, is 75 grams. Don't ask me why it's 75 grams, but that's what it is. The problem is they sell pasta in packs of 500 grams. Couple of issues I always have with this. 500 is not divisible by 75 equally. So there's always wasted pasta if you weigh the pasta. And secondly, who weighs spaghetti? Have you tried weighing your spaghetti, everything? So, so you're there and I don't weigh my pasta. So you're kind of tipping everything. Oh, is that 75? Oh, oh, 500 grams have gone in. So maybe sometimes it's easier just not to have the pasta in the house. But this is not what I'm here to talk about. So what I'm here to talk about is the movement today um, of people to remove entire food groups from their diet, entire classes of food from their diet for no clinical reason whatsoever, all because they could perceive it to be healthier. So gluten-free is, is a classic example. People have seen these, right? Gluten-free is a classic example. Okay, stop. Clearly 1% of the human species are celiac. Okay, they're allergic to gluten. And for Pete's sake, please stay away from gluten, okay? And actually, about 3 to 4%, roughly speaking, of the population are probably genuinely gluten intolerant. And this can range anywhere from being a little bit farty to, to, to severe gastrointestinal you, you know, distress. So please stay away from gluten. But up to 25% of us, okay, certainly in the UK and Europe, certainly in North America, uh, have bought gluten-free at some point. In fact, so much so it's begun to be monetized so that you have now foods which never had gluten to begin with being labeled as gluten-free. Gluten-free rice. Rice doesn't have gluten. Never had gluten. Doesn't have to be labeled gluten-free, but it now sells, okay? Gluten-free, gluten-free water. For Pete's sake, Google gluten-free shampoo, okay? Now I'm not eating shampoo. You get millions of hits for people, but gluten-free, I'm going off piste here. What I want to talk about today in the, in the next five minutes, don't, don't worry, is two of the, the, the really hot button topics. First, dairy. Mm. So is dairy per se bad for you? So people are saying, I don't want to eat my dairy. Now clearly 
I'm Chinese or ethnically Chinese and I'm lactose intolerant. And so, no, I don't drink a lot of milk. Okay. But for the, for, for many other people, they give it up because they think it's healthier. Is it, is dairy unhealthy for you per se? And second, plant veganism, plant-based diets. Okay. So is it healthier for you? Is animal-based protein really that bad for you? And so those two hot button topics I'm going to cover in five minutes. Okay. So dairy first. Now we know, in fact, I don't know if you do know, actually, 20% of the dairy products sold in the supermarket today that you might, you might go to have not emerged from a creature at all, okay? They're plant-based milks, and they're all manner of plant-based uh, uh, plant milks um, um, available. So as I said, ethnically, I'm Chinese, and so I have drank soy milk all my life. Okay. Now, except that Chinese people don't call it milk. We call it a broth, a soy broth, and we certainly don't do anything weird like pour it into coffee. But you white people do what you got to do, okay? So, and then there's all kinds of random things in here. Quinoa milk. How do you milk a quinoa? I mean, like seriously, it's the most random things in the world and they're, and, 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 and they're there. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going off piste. Um, in fact, you can now have, other supermarkets are available. You can now have your free from Christmas, okay? Um, free from anything at all. You can have it, it's amazing. So, dairy. So I am lactose intolerant, as I, as, as I said. Um, lactose intolerance actually in very many ways is a misnomer. And it's a misnomer because we're all mammals. We're sat here, hopefully we're all mammals. And because by the fact that we're mammals, we were able to drink milk as babies, okay? And this is true for all mammals. It's one of our defining features after all. But what happens is for the vast majority of mammalian species, including most of humans, including two thirds of human beings, we become lactose intolerant as we become adults. So there's two questions, how and why, okay? So the how. Now, lactose is a sugar, like glucose, like fructose, okay? Um, but mammals cannot absorb lactose per se, okay? It needs to be digested into glucose and galactose. So those are the two sugars that make lactose. And the lactose is broken down, metabolized by a gene called lactase, which is actually in, in the wall of the small intestine. So lactose comes in, lactase uh, um, um, cleaves it we, absorb the, we absorb the sugar, we use it as energy. Okay. Now, so this is true in babies, but what happens is the lactase gene, okay, in most, in the vast majority of mammals, which are turned on as babies, is then shut off as you become an adult. So in other words, a protein comes upstream, it binds upstream of lactase and shuts it off as you become an adult, which is why, for, for me, for example, which is why now as an adult, I can't drink a lot of milk because my lactose stays in my gut rather than being metabolized and actually, and, and actually absorbed. So that's the how. How about why? Well, and, and this is true, by the way, for most mammals. Like you, people think you're going to fit feed uh, a milk to cats. Don't do that. Your cat is lactose intolerant as an adult. Like seriously, right? So the question is why? I mean, I, I guess we don't know, but, but you can speculate that actually it's probably to try and incentivize. Look, you're trying to make room on the boob for, for university age Johnny to get moving and so that baby Johnny can actually have room. Okay, there's limited space, A. Eh? Um, um, and you know, there's, they need the food. So I think a big driver is probably to incentivize a rapidly growing mammal to shove off and actually get some, get some solid food. And that's probably, the, that's probably a, a reasonable reason. Now, hang on, hang on. The Northern Europeans amongst you are already uh, are typing into the chat saying, well, how about me? Okay, so about 7,500 7, years or so ago, okay, a mutation was probably was carried into, uh, into Europe, um, um, into where Denmark today. And what happened is the mutation sits upstream of the lactase gene. And the key thing here is it prevented the protein from shutting off lactase. Now, wh why did this happen? Well, people begin to realize something, okay? So at the dawn of, 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 of agriculture, you had farming not only of, of uh, plants, but then you had the domestication of animals, ruminants in particular, cows, uh, sheep, uh, goats. And people begin to realize, hang on a second, if we actually drank the milk of a cow, goat, sheep, before we ate the animal, we'd get a lot more calories. And so paleo, um, uh, paleo agriculturists, it's a thing, okay, calculated that a Neolithic cow, so a cave cow, okay, would produce roughly like seven to 800 liters of milk per year. Now compare this to a current modern Holstein Frisian cow, which makes 10,000 liters of milk a year. But even the Neolithic cow at that seven to 800 liters, 
that seven, 800 liters of milk is 10 times the amount of calories that you find in the cow by itself. Now, remember, we never had enough food, okay? Even in agriculture. So having suddenly 10 times the number of calories from a given animal over here was a huge selection pressure for people to be able to adapt to. And so when this mutation was brought in, suddenly those people who were able to take advantage of this new source of food, milk and then cheese, okay, begin to thrive and, be, and, and that, that mutation, okay, because not all mutations are bad, begin to spread throughout Europe. Today, 85% of Northern Europeans can drink milk as adults. They're lactase persistent, this terminology, 85%. Every single one of you has exactly that same mutation which sits upstream of lactase, preventing the gene from being turned off. It's not present in me, it's present in you. You have adapted to a new uh, a food source, which is why you are able to drink milk. So I guess the question here is this, or, and eat dairy, latte or a soy latte? Well, it depends on who you are. Me, a soy latte, or actually black, black Americanos. But if you have the adaptation to digest dairy products, then please remember that lactose is lactose. It doesn't matter where it comes from. It can come from human milk, ick, cow milk, goat milk, sheep milk, Camel milk, it's all the same milk. If you have, it's all the same lactose. If you have the adaptation to drink milk, then it's then dairy per se is not bad for you. Now, drinking too much dairy products, you have a waistline issue, but that's a discussion for another day. That's a different problem. How about veganism? So one of the things which I used to do was to present um, a, a program called uh, one of the presenters on Trust Me, I'm a Doctor. And uh, the producers came to me one day uh, um, and asked the question, you know, about whether or not I'd investigate if it was healthy to be healthy to be vegan. Now, there are many reasons why people uh, um, become vegan. Okay, there are ethical concerns, there are environmental concerns. All of these are entirely valid. Okay, um, but this is a health program. Uh, was a health program, and so we I was tasked with investigating the health the health asp aspects today. So I'll just focus on this on this today. And so they asked the question, well, is it healthy to be vegan? And so I went vegan for 29 days, not that I was counting. So I guess the first question is that, is vegan food per se just healthier for you? Now, if you think about it, then clearly the answer is going to be no, not necessarily. I mean, I could have spent my entire 29 days eating chips, uh, eating Oreos. Um, they would have been vegan, but I would hardly have, no one, you know, even squinting would say that was actually healthy. I haven't found this product. This is an amazing product. Hey, these are bacon rashers, mm -hmm. a savory and crunchy, a classic snack. Um, no artificial flavors or colorings, but vegan. So I said, wow, what is this magic food? So, so um, as it turns out, when I read no artificial flavors or colorings, it's no artificial bacon flavorings or colorings, but you know, you can put in turmeric and, and smoked paprika or something in order to do it. Anyway, I could have spent the entire time eating this and that wouldn't have been healthy. So I decided to do a plant-based approach, whole foods, plant-based approach, where we're eating things like pulses and lentils and, and you know, whole grains, et cetera, that, that, that kind of thing. So what were the scores on the door? Okay, 29 days. First of all, I lost four kilograms, some 2.2, so nearly 11 pounds, okay, in 29 days without really trying. I know people say this, but really without really trying. The trying bit was being vegan. And my blood cholesterol levels dropped by 12%. My God, I, on the face of it, I'm like the, the, the health campaign for veganism. I should, I should tweet. I should put an Instagram account together. Um, but here's the question. Okay, why? Why did I lose? Let's tackle the weight first. Why did I lose the weight? Now, here's the, the thing. When you're doing plant-based, you're eating a lot of bulky food. And as it turns out, plant-based food is just more bulky. You got to eat a lot of lentils to match the calories in the steak. And there's only so much time in a day you can chew. Okay, so, so what happened? Why did I lose weight? Because I ate less food. Grossly, as per kilo, I ate more food, but I ate less calories because it was bulkier food. Now, veganism just happened for me to be a useful strategy to reduce the calories I was eating. But it is not the only way. You could eat less, you could do Mediterranean, you could do any number of the other diets, intermittent fasting, any of the number of diets out there which reduce the calories would have actually worked. It just happens to be an effective strategy for me to try and lose weight. Why did my cholesterol levels drop? Okay, um, It's because largely 
I cut out saturated fat from my diet, which for me, I knew came primarily from animal-based products. Okay. Now, clearly there are going to be um, plant-based products which have saturated fat, coconut milk being a classic example of this, but I knew that for me, meat was my, meat was my thing. But there are two, so this is why my cholesterol levels dropped. But there are two buts to, to, to the story. First, I would have had exactly the same effect if I had gone onto a pescatarian diet where I ate largely fish. Okay, because why? Because fish is full of unsaturated fats. And, and so by shifting from saturated to unsaturated fats, my cholesterol levels would have dropped. Second, and it's a very big but, is that for some that I happen to know that my cholesterol levels were sensitive to diet. But for many, for quite a few people out there, okay, because of your genes, your cholesterol levels are not sensitive to diet. Some people's cholesterol levels are set high, medium, low. And for those who are set high, the only way to drop them is not going to be diet. It's going to be down to drugs. Okay. And so it is always important when you see some pretty person, I'm not a pretty person, post something that I'm on X diet, it worked. And they look, and it probably did work for them. It probably did work for them. But will it necessarily work for you? Why did they lose the weight is always the question. Why did they become healthier is always the question I think that you have to ask. Now, your truth number three and number four are tied together, okay? And I want to argue that your truth number three and number four explain how every single diet that works, works, okay? Now, it might seem like a big thing to say, but just, just stick with me here, folks, okay? So your truth number three, food that takes longer to digest generally makes you feel fuller. Okay. Now, in order to, to understand this, we have to know about our food to poop tube, <laughs> our gastrointestinal tract. Now, in the days where we could all do things live and in living color, I would have shown you, and in fact, I'm showing you now, but there's no impact. There's no impact. Our life size, this is the mouth tongue bit, my life size human knitted gut. Now, at the, uh, at the effort of making this look like a, like a thingy, so here are the pillows. Okay, here the pillow. Life size. This is the pillows we represent our in our organs. This is the small intestine. I'm still going, guys. This is this is the small intestine. Okay. It's long. It's long. It's all origami into us. And here is our poop tube and comes out the other side. 21 feet, 20, 20 to 22 feet. Plus or minus half a feet, half a foot, depending if you're six foot or four foot two. Okay. But all our food is processed through through this particular tube. And understanding how diets work require an intimate understanding of this of, of, of this tube. And food that takes longer to digest travels further down the gut. And because of a change in hormones that are released, make you feel fuller. So let me just give you um, an example. Okay. So a calorie of protein will make you full, will make you feel fuller than a calorie of fat, than a calorie of carb in that order. Why? Because chemically speaking, Protein is the most complex to pull apart, to metabolize compared to fat, compared to carbs. Okay. As a result, it travels further than gut, down the gut and it makes you feel fuller for every given calorie. Okay. So, and this actually is the explanation of how the vast majority of high protein diets work. So let's consider Atkins, just, just as an example. Okay. People think Atkins is about the carbs, low carb, no carb, no carb, low carb. Okay. But it is low carb or no carb or whatever, but it's less about the carbs, it has a little bit to do with the carbs, but primarily because you actually increase the amount of protein you eat. It makes you feel fuller, you eat less, you actually lose weight. It's, 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 it's a basic principle. So if you look at this diet emporium that's here, this is how these work. Paleo, okay, high protein. Um, uh, uh, high, just prior to low carb, high fat, keto, okay, carnivore, which is whatever. Okay. I mean, these are all high protein diets that people swear by that have, if you go read how all these diets work, I mean, there's complicated explanations, page after page after page. Dude, they're high protein diets. You feel full, you eat less, you lose weight. Okay. Now, your truth number four. Okay. So that's the first thing. Food that takes longer to digest makes you feel fuller. Your truth number four, remember they're tied together. Don't blindly count calories. Okay, so what is a calorie? A calorie, a kilocalorie I'm talking about here, a calorie is the amount of energy it takes to raise one liter of water, one degree Celsius at sea level. Okay, so it is a unit of energy. 
um, and it should be all be equal, except that we have to take into consideration caloric availability. Now, what is caloric availability? Caloric availability is the amount of calories you can extract from a food versus the total number of calories trapped in the food. Okay, so let me just give you some, some, some examples. Now, if you had 100 calories of sugar, this is sucrose here, for example, it's, it's, it's a glucose and fructose together, one cut absorbed, that's it. Barely any energy is used to actually digest sugar. So when you have 100 calories of sugar, you probably get close to 97 calories of, of calories. Okay, now depending on what kind of other carbs you eat, such as if you ate complex starch, then maybe that's 92 to 95%, so 95 calories per 100 calories. If, however, you ate sweet corn, corn on the cob. Now, everyone knows that when you eat 100 calories of sweet, 100 calories of sweet corn, and then you look in the loo the next morning, you have absorbed nowhere close to 100 calories of sweet corn, okay? Yet, when you take sweet corn and you desiccate it and you turn it into cornmeal, and then you make either corn tortillas or corn bread, suddenly a far greater percentage of exactly that same corn, the calories are more available because you have processed the food. So when, when someone is actually um, going on some diet in which they can only eat 400 calories a day or something, it makes a difference if they're eating 400 calories of sugar, 400 calories of sweet corn, or 400 calories of corn tortilla, okay? It makes, it does make a difference where your food comes from. You shouldn't be counting calories blindly. So let me just give you another example, steak, okay? So, so say this is a fillet steak, Say you had 400 calories of a steak cooked medium rare. How long does it take to cook that? Depending on how big it is, five, seven minutes, a few minutes, okay? Even if you wanted to murder the steak, you might cook it for 15, okay? And that turned it entirely gray. But imagine if you took exactly the same piece of meat, minced it up, boil it in a meat sauce for two hours, layer it into a lasagna, cook the lasagna for two hours, freeze the lasagna, because who eats the whole lasagna? Okay, and then heat it for an hour the next day again, okay, and actually, and actually eat it. Suddenly, this same piece of meat, exactly the same piece of meat that has now been cooked for rather for than five minutes for five hours becomes more calorically available, which means that for every given bite, you extract more. Cooking is an external stomach. Digesting costs energy. So if you actually cook something, you remove the energy that you need to put in to digest, to digest the food. Please don't get me wrong. I love steak. I love lasagna. That's not my point. My point is blindly counting calories without actually looking into how the food is prepared, where the food comes from, just for the sake of it means absolutely nothing. Now, I have got colleagues of mine at the MRC epidemiology unit down at, um, down at um, Adam Brooks who have shown, for example, that calorie information at point of purchase Okay, like when you line up at Starbucks or Costa and, and this 400 calorie muffin, you go, <gasps> okay. Now that signal would actually on average reduce purchasing, reduce the likelihood of you purchasing that muffin and hence presumably consuming the muffin by around 8%. Okay, so clearly at point of purchase, it does give you pause for thought and it does have that function. But blindly counting it per se without considering its source makes absolutely no sense. Now, if we go back to this diet and program, Okay, and then we begin to see, well, hang on a second. Then you start to think, well, uh, plant-based. Okay, I already brought this example up. Why did, did I lose weight? Because the food is calorically less available. Lentils, they're the same as sweet corn. They go in the shape as a flying saucer and come out the other side shaped like a flying saucer. Nothing much happens to them between them. I haven't absorbed any of the calories at all, right? And so that's how that works. This is going to be true for the Mediterranean diet, for the low GI diet, and even considering protein, because paleo and the high and the high carb, high fat diet, low carb, high fat diets are here, where the, the caloric availability of something like fat is 97%, so close to sugar, okay, which means that for every 100 calories of fat you eat, you get 97 calories out. But protein, depending on how you cook it, will only ever be on average 70% available, which means that for every 100 calories of protein that you eat, you only ever really absorb about 70 calories of protein. So protein not only makes you feel fuller because it takes longer to digest as it's going down the stomach, it's also less available, which means that for every cal calorie you eat, you actually eat less. And, and the same thing is going to be true for fiber, okay? Now, fiber, we can't digest at all, mostly. And so it comes up, it comes through the other side. But what happens is it, two things happen. 
fiber slows down the digestion process, which means that food travels further down the gut, okay? And it also slows and evens out the release of glucose, the carbohydrates within the food, because your body has to fight through the fiber in order to try and get the, try and get the carbohydrates out. And if you take those two things, food that takes longer to digest, makes you feel fuller, and caloric availability, and put those two together, it explains how every single diet that works, works. So two more, and these are, these are very quick and I'll, and I'll shut up. So eat more unsaturated fats. I've really sort of touched on this in, in my vegan experiment, right? Because I cut, out uns, I cut out saturated fats and suddenly my cholesterol levels drop. And so unsaturated fats famously, uh, famously are high in plant-based foods such as avocados and nuts and, um, and olive oil, but also, as I mentioned, in fish. And there are multiple epidemiological studies which show that if you shift the ratio between saturated and unsaturated fats, so you have more unsaturated fats, that it decreases all-cause mortality, deadness, <laughs> okay, which is a good thing. Now, so this is unequivocal. However, the mechanisms clearly are going to be complex for everything which I've talked about. So do you respond to diet? Uh, you know, how do your lipid and cholesterol levels and profile respond to diets? What do you eat, um, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but I think it's safe to say that it's a good thing in life there if you just shift that ratio slightly to actually have more unsaturated versus saturated fat. And your truth number six, don't fear food. Actually, this is not... Don't fear food. This is not actually biologically based per se. Um, it's a more philosophical one. But um, what do we mean by fear of food? So this is um, Goop, everyone's favorite actress's uh, a lifestyle page. I'm not trying to drive clicks. Where she and you can look this up. This is true. Where she is driving the uh, leanest livable weight. Now, if you say that out loud, leanest livable weight, that is to be as skinny as possible without dying. Now, and that doesn't encapsulate the, the whole point of being fearful of food. I don't know what does. And in fact, I did this at New Scientist Live, um, was it when we could, I don't know when the last time we could travel was and, and talk. Um, and uh, someone in the media from the Daily Mail uh, um, picked this up and then made this thing about me. I never met Gwyneth. This is, look, they put this picture in the thing, it makes me look like I'm chums with her and arguing with her across the table. I've never met her, okay? Um, but you Google this. This is, this is true and this is fear of food. Now I'm gonna go back to what I said at the beginning of the talk. Is the vast majority of, of non-communicable disease diet related today? It is. We have an obesity epidemic, Okay, which interesting, and it's other sequelae, so um, type two diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, heart disease, yada, 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 et cetera, et cetera. So that in of itself is causing all manner of problems for our health service. Throw in a pandemic, okay, of like, like, such as COVID, and suddenly you realize that this risk of metabolic disease, or, or if you are in, in, in full-blown metabolic disease, suddenly you do a hell of a lot worse. Famously, now we know a hell of a lot worse with being infected by a communicable disease. So do we need to fix the problem? Of course we do, okay? Of course we do. But why do we have to do it by fearing food? What have you heard over the last 40 minutes or so? I hope what you've heard is that I've talked about understanding our food. I love my food. Okay, and, 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 and how it interacts with us. But I don't speak about food with fear. Okay, we need to learn to re-love our food. We need to love our food. We just need to eat a little bit less of our, of, of, of our food. And I also draw a huge distinction between pointing out the problem, which this is, and blaming the people suffering from the problem. So um, guys, uh, this is the book, okay? As, 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 I, as, as I said, I, um, um, I go through all things in, in, in a lot more detail, but here's the thing. I haven't given any plan. I haven't given anyone any advice and everyone's like, well, well, how do I lose weight? Okay, so I'm gonna give you not a plan, but just some, just some thoughts. You're not gonna like the thoughts, but there we go. I'm gonna hit you with them anyway. So the first is you have to do you. Now, I don't wanna sound like a fortune cookie, but, but you, you, you kind of do, okay? Because all of us are different. You got to do, and you got to find whatever it, whatever it is that suits you. Not only your biology, which is what I study, but your lifestyle. Do you commute? Uh, are you rich or poor? Um, do, you have, do you work shifts? Do you have kids? And you might wonder, what does that have to do with anything? Because that influences the time you have, the amount of cash you might have, um, what you may choose to do with your time, how quickly do you have to produce dinner? 
if you need to lose weight and you have to pick a diet, okay, then you have to find something that suits not only your biology, but your lifestyle. Otherwise, you're not going to stick to it. Now, why is that important? Because the diet only works when it sticks to it. My diet didn't work. It didn't work. It didn't work because you came off the diet. People say that 95% of diets don't work. Not technically true. 95% of diets we can't stick to. Okay, so you need to be able to find something. And this is the depressing element of it. Okay, the losing the weight is actually relatively easy. Most people motivated will lose some weight. Keeping it off forever is the difficulty. Okay, and it is a lifestyle change. I think we have to stop calling it going on a diet. And, and I'm not trying to propose anything of that sort. But we have to put together a lifestyle change that we are able to stick to if we want to lose some weight and actually manage to keep the weight off. And finally, to misquote a, a, a wonderful author, everything in moderation, including moderation. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Giles Yeo. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you, Giles. Right, we have a number of questions in oh the- Oh my God. <laughs> That's um, a lot of questions. All I'm gonna say is that Tyler's busy eating right now because he's really <laughs> taking that to heart. And I'm going to be really shocked if it's not a donut in moderation. It's a, um, it's an arrow bar. I didn't say I finished the whole book yet, but um, yeah, it's, it's giving me food for thought. So, um, uh, ooh, that's a good segue, actually. Let, let's start with questions and see if we can condense some of them. Let me start, Sarah, um, in terms of comfort eating. And uh, uh, we have a couple questions here from Alice and um uh, um, the idea of what happens with stress eating and comfort eating when it's not even about hunger and it really just comes down to a, like an emotional sort of feeling and uh, are there pros and cons have you noticed any changes recently perhaps in kind of like the our, our habits or like you know in general when it comes to like stress comfort eating and these sort of things so any number of things there because the, the, the stress comfort eating thing is very very interesting right because as I said uh, at the very beginning we are, can almost be divided equally, I'm not sure equally, but into two different groups in response to stress. So not tiger stress, we all respond to tiger stress in the same way, run like hell and don't think about food because people who didn't respond like that became an X person, okay? I'm talking about work stress, COVID stress, whatever stress, so, so a, a chronic rise in it. Why do some of us eat in response, me, okay? And some of us suddenly stop eating. And I, the answer mechanistically is I don't think we fully know, okay, in, in terms of, but it probably has to do with the fact that um, stress is unpleasant by its very definition, and you want to stop the stress from happening, right? You, you, you want to do that. And for some people, that is turning to food because food, whatever it does, it does, food does, I'd like to think food does two things. It does the mechanics of making sure you're not hungry, but it also, to a lot of people, feels good. It tickles the part of your brains, the ooh feeling in food. And I think for some people, that is a good way of relieving the stress. Now, for other people, <laughs> this could be drugs and alcohol. Um, it could be bungee jumping. It could be running. Okay. And that is, once again, those are also perfectly uh, uh, um, and widely practiced um, stress relievers. So I think that that's where the comfort eating has come from. Then the question is whether or not something like COVID is going to be driving, therefore, an increase in weight. And I think the evidence, um, I have no solid evidence, and actually, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert at the epidemiology behind it, but just looking from first principles, A, not everyone will respond to, to, to it by eating, but I think there will be people that, that, that will end up eating more. Just as, as an example, um, at the very beginning of, of lockdown, and this is the second lockdown, our first lockdown, where everyone was in a blind panic. We didn't, there's no toilet paper, there's no beans, right? And so I will wake up in the morning on a Tuesday, okay, and go down and make cornbread. When did I ever make cornbread on a Tuesday? When did I ever make cornbread? Okay, suddenly I had a, hung, a hankering for cornbread. Um, and so I think there are probably a lot of people like me. And plus, when you're working from home, suddenly there's a lot more time to go marinate your foods, right? I mean, I can run down and come back up. So I, I definitely think that this past year, nine months, it's been so long, um, has influenced uh, our, our feeding behavior, undoubtedly. Giles, just to comment, we've just done a study on Cambridge Shear Schools on children's diets um, and looking at the composition of diets in light of um, school closures mm -hmm. and the amount of prepackaged food and thereby calories and the kind of um, non-nutrient dense foods that you were talking about is just hugely increased in children's diets. And I mean, from the composition is changed too. 
Now from there, so the reason why from the kid's perspective, okay, is why that could happen. It could be because the kids are responding to stress as well. That is uh, because why not? Kids are mini adults. But a lot of it probably has to do with the fact, well, you're working, you, 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 they're not at school, you're working at home. So at the end of the day, you're going, ah, I have no time to do it. You end up, it's just a lot easier to, to, to pack the house with, 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 with prepackaged foods as well. So there's also that element of, of, of why suddenly this current scenario has changed the way we've eaten. And we had a question here from somebody about how, when you are emotionally eating, is there any scientific or advice that you could give um, about the ways to change that behavior? I, I mean, there are any number of different, I'm not a psychologist when it comes to these things, but I know that people, some people undergo, I, you know, you can say, you can say something like cognitive behavioral therapy. And yes, it probably will work for some people. I, I think as with, most people trying to lose weight, you have to be honest with the way you respond to food, right? And, and if you know, if you know that you respond to, to, to stress by eating and everyone, you, you, you know yourself, then you try to put together a strategy. I'm not saying it's easy, but try to put together a strategy where you respond to that stress, not by eating. So if you don't necessarily have a lot of food. So for me, uh, um, not that I want to back myself into a cultural stereotype here. My comfort food where I actually eat when I'm stressed is noodles. Okay. So it's just it. Okay. And, and, and so if you have less of that in the house, for example, I'm not being anti-noodle. This is, this, this is me. Okay. Then you're less likely to therefore be eating. I think, I think there should be some way of putting a strategy in place. Sometimes you do have to eat the noodles. That's just the way it is. But maybe you don't eat as much noodles, for example. And so one of the other questions here was for people who have managed to lose weight, mm -hmm. um, many of them gain it back because of physiological responses, mm -hmm. increased hunger levels, decreased um, caloric expenditure. Is it realistic, therefore, to think that we can fight biology? <laughs> um I think it's tough. And, and, and once again, I'm so sorry I'm depressing people just as before they're heading to dinner. Um, but there are a couple of um, there are a couple of positive things. So so a couple of things. First, as you lose the weight, so how do you then make yourself make sure you eat less or don't put the weight back on? You have to eat slightly less. You have to change that balance. So make eat food that will make you feel slightly fuller to help you to help you uh, uh, reduce that. So that's to, to help you stop or at least minimize or mitigate against the regaining of weight. So this is increasing your protein levels slightly which incidentally doesn't only mean meat. I just want to point out um, um, protein from any source, tofu, beans, okay? They do the same thing, okay? Protein from meat just happens to be denser than anything else, but protein from anything will have the same thing and food that's higher in fiber and that will help you be fuller. That's the, that's, that's the first thing. That's, oh, I, I lost my train of thought. So there's, oh, then, then, then the, the, the second thing that you got to want to do, I did lose my train of thought, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was there thinking about the protein and, and the fiber for losing ah um, exercise. Now, exercise famously is not good for weight loss per se without tackling the food intake. Okay, it isn't. All the, the things I show that if you, the problem is we don't exercise, we're not like Tour de France cyclists. Okay, we don't exercise enough to lose weight uh, um, um, because we don't just don't exercise enough. But once you have lost the weight, Exercise is very, exercise, physical activity, and I'm not even talking about going to the gym necessarily. Physical activity is effective, okay, in uh, increasing your energy expenditure ever so slightly and helping you actually keep the weight off. So what you need to do is a two-stage process where you need to lose the weight first, and then you begin the exercise process just, just a little, you know, don't go nuts, uh, uh, in order to increase your energy expenditure to help you keep the weight off. Interesting. Um, we have a couple questions. Speaking of um, kind of like cyclists and um, athletes, um, mm -hmm. a couple, two questions here about intermittent fasting, asking on the one hand, your, your general thoughts um, based on that, based on your own research and a specific question about um, athletes. So it is, um, could intermittent fasting be, um, you know, harmful in some way for endurance athletes like runners or cyclists or these sort of things? I'll start, I'll tackle with that first, okay? So intermittent fasting, you'd go on it to try and lose weight. And if you are an actual endurance athlete, why are you intermittently fasting? I'll just give you the one, the, the one example for, I'm no, by no means an endurance athlete. You know, no imagination I'm an athlete. But I went um, for the same, trust me, I'm a doctor program. 
um, uh, as part of this dietary experiment, I went on intermittent fasting um, diet for the month as well, okay, to see to see what would happen. And so this was this is, and I did the classical five two. So so in other words, regular normal caloric intake, and then I did a six hundred calorie for two days in a row. But I commute to work by cycling, okay, and I live about uh, fifteen miles away from from Adam Brooks. So so for me, it's a thirty mile thirty mile cycle every day. So I was doing this for a TV program, so I didn't want to cheat, right? Because it'd be stupid, the dumb thing to do. But the problem is when you are the fasting days at 600 calories, having to do 30 miles of cycling, uh, it was just, it got dangerous because in fact, what happened was uh, the third week that I was, I was doing it, clearly I had gotten too hungry. I was on my way home one, one evening and I suddenly, I found myself underneath a car. The car was not moving, it was a parked car. It was a parked car, but clearly a car had appeared out of nowhere. It didn't appear out of nowhere, it was there, it was parked, okay? But I had clearly just lost concentration, just d- done something because I was doing my intermittent, um, my intermittent fasting. I think if you're, if you're doing that kind of energy expenditure and doing that, I think intermittent, there's a lot of things you can do. I think intermittent fasting is a dumb thing to do in that scenario. It mm-hmm. does, however, work for a lot of people. And so the question is, um, is there anything, and it's particularly useful because we know it's actually a, a good strategy to reduce your caloric, to, to, to produce a caloric deficit. It is, okay? So the question is, however, is, in addition to the caloric deficit, is there any magical other metabolic effects? Now, animal studies uh, uh, in mice in particular suggest that there probably is uh, uh, subtle effects. Okay, so not huge gigantic effects, but subtle effects. Um, The main issue is that high quality human data is still not really readily available. Okay, So, so some people overstate the effects based on evidence. That being said, would I be surprised if someone showed me that actually the mouse data, you know, the human data in a high quality trial supports the mouse data, that there's, there are going to be subtle metabolic uh, benefits? I wouldn't be surprised because intermittent fasting probably does genuinely represent how we probably ate in the past, where we didn't have antelope all the time. We had antelope sometimes and no antelope other times, intermittent fasting. So um, the evidence is still not there yet to overstate things too strongly, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was a, a subtle effect. There was also some questions speaking about those kind of subtle effects about um, what your views on raspberry ketones are and weight loss supplements in general. Okay, so I think let's deal with the ketones first. So, so, so ketones is to try, as far as I understand, taking ketones is supposed to be a shortcut to get your body into a ketogenic uh, state. Someone can correct me if I'm if 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 I'm wrong. This is why you take the ketones to try and so you can go ketogenic is where you have largely burnt the the carbohydrate stores in your body, so your glycogen, uh, um, and your body turns to burning largely fat. Okay, and so it's the process of breaking down fat that then releases these ketones, and it does two, it does um, and the ketones tend to signal to the brain. Um, to make you feel slightly fuller, okay? And so this is how a ketogenic diet, broadly speaking, works. It maintains your blood glucose levels. I won't go into why, but, 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 it, but it also makes you feel fuller. And so that's the, the raspberry ketone thing. It's got to be, right, from first principles. Supplements, it depends what kind of supplements we're talking about, okay? So I know some athletes uh, um, take protein supplements because you lift a lot. And I can see probably protein supplements were, were working there. I think normal Joe Schmoes like me, um, uh, I'm doing the kind of exercise that I do, can get all the protein we need, particularly since I'm middle class and living in Cambridge, all the protein I need from my, from, from my diet. Um, there are going to be other supplements as, as the same as all uh, uh, supplements, the vitamin supplementation. I think vitamin supplementation, there's a pretty general rule, which, um, because I did an investigation of that as well into another TV program, uh, a pretty safe rule to follow is if you can afford to buy vitamin supplements, the chances are you don't need it. And the people who can't afford to buy it are probably the ones that need it. There are some examples, vitamin D, when, when you've got a tropical boy in the Northern rock, such as this vitamin D, I am vitamin D deficient, iron for, for ladies, Okay, folic acid, if you're trying to get pregnant, B12, if you are are, a vegan. Okay, so one of the questions that came that followed on from that question was, Mm -hmm. why do you think the supplement industry is doing so well? Because all of us are lazy freaking human beings and all of us love the idea of health in a pill. 
when the actual answer to everything, your truth number two is moderation, boring and tough. Okay, but that that is helpful. And actually, being more and being more active. And it's, it's some people just prefer, and many people, because we're human beings, would prefer to have that uh, that health in a pill. That's why the vitamin companies are not allowed. If you actually look at the verbal gymnastics that, that the vitamin companies um, use, vitamins are not regulated like drugs. In fact, they're not regulated at all, okay, in this country, none, okay? So whereas a drug, acet uh, um, paracetamol, Tylenol, okay, um, this actually stops my headache. And it knows because there's clinical trials and it actually works. A vitamin... There's nothing. It just so what it can't say is this is going to cure vitamin C. Okay, that this that this can cure whatever it is can cure, but it can says it contributes to normal function of the body. What they do with the vitamin companies is they is they have a guy with big pecs, okay, and standing there going, okay, contributes to normal. And so what you see is they haven't done anything illegal, but you see Adonis stood there and thinking, oh, eat eat this and look like me. So so I think that's part of the allure is the laziness of human beings wanting to be able to have health in a pill. There's also a load of questions here about um, aging and life course. So a lot of people are asking things about women in menopause. Um, and there's somebody here who has quite wonderfully put it that as of middle age, their metabolism seems to have fallen off a cliff. Um, those sorts of questions. Could you comment on um, what kinds of influence life course has here and why do we put on more weight, speaking as a woman who's approaching this stage during things like the menopause? Okay, so, so I'll deal with menopause first. So women are, men are very simple creatures. We are, okay? We, we eat, we like to think about food and the other thing. That's two things we think about. Then we're born and we die. That's men, very, very simple, okay? Now, women, I want to argue are, depending on not whether or not you have children, okay, are four completely different species okay, through, through your life. You have a woman pre-baby. We have the pregnant woman who, by the way, because you're trying to keep a parrot, I'm a dad, by the way, you're trying to keep a parasite in you for, for, for nine months, um, is a completely different species when you're pregnant. The woman post-baby, we know the women who are like rubber bands, the babies come out and they're like, pum, pum, they come back in, whereas a lot of women don't lose the baby weight and the woman post-menopause, okay? Now, what uh, you know, is the similarity, what, what times all four of those different women in your life course together, your hormonal status. Okay, so these are changing times. And so because of the change in hormones, you begin to, to actually change and, and things just become different. And, and because it's not just single hormone, right? It's a whole mix of different hormones that actually happen. We, you behave differently. In terms of the menopause, okay, the biggest hormonal change in the, men, in, in the menopause is obviously your, a drastic drop in estrogen, okay? Whereas your testosterone levels, broadly speaking, stay the same. Now, women have testosterone as well. But the shifting of the ratio in a woman between your estrogen and testosterone then when you get past the menopause gives that ratio, it means that you become, uh, you have a more, more, not a more male-like pattern of hormonal response because of this drop in estrogen. You have an androgenization, which means that women, a lot of women, many women going past the menopause begin to change their body shape because of where they put their fat. Men put fat in different places than women do, okay, until this happens. And so women past the menopause change their shape. There's nothing you can do about that. I'm really sorry, but there's nothing. There's nothing you can do about that. Um, 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 for that, uh, if, if your hormonal levels are going to be changing, you just have to do what we do. You've got to watch, your, watch what, you, what you're eating, try and stay active. That's about all I, uh, all I can say. What about life course? So life course is an interesting thing, okay? So this is a very, that's a very, very, very long, long, long answer. And what happens is, um, I think, look, at kids, you, 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 because you're growing, and so you can actually, largely speaking, eat whatever the hell you want. Not, not that's technically true, but but because you're because you're growing, anyone with teenage boys, empty, empty, empty legs. Okay, you eat eat that eat that much until you stop growing. Then you have this huge chunk of life in which clearly there's all of this situations we're trying to fight. Um, we're getting more senior. We're sitting on the table. Uh, uh, on on you know we, we we're not moving as much and and all of these things. And there's this large chunk of life, your middle life, in which you're worried about everything that we're worried about. Then you get old, okay? Then you become, and then actually what then happens is a big thing about getting old is you then end up losing your muscle mass a lot. 
and and there is in terms of at the, towards that end of um, um, the, the the living spectrum, the most closely related thing to health in all people is muscle mass. So it doesn't actually is less about your body size, but about your absolute amount of muscle that you have, and that seems to mark a, a, a healthier a healthier profile. And so for someone who's getting um, um, who's who's getting old, resistance training. Once again, I'm not talking about pumping iron, but you know making sure you stand up and down in the chair, so, 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 just pressure against the wall in order to make sure you maintain your muscle mass as you age. And I, so those, I think, uh, are particularly the most important for old people, older people. I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, there's an interesting one here, I think, about uh, BMI. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, since you're talking about some of these things already, and um, uh, what are your thoughts on BMI as a, uh, um, uh, what word should I use, uh, accurate or helpful indicator of, uh, you know, a healthy diet, healthy nutrition? So, I mean, famously, so BMI, it, it's, it's clearly your weight, uh, your height in meat, your height in meters divided by your weight. Your BMI is your weight in kilos divided by your height in meters squared. It's a way of actually controlling for, for your, your height. Right. But it doesn't take into account muscle mass. Okay, and muscle mass is more dense than fat. Um, um, and so you can be technically speaking obese, uh, um, but yet be perfectly healthy because you're carrying a lot of muscle mass. Okay, so on an individual basis, BMI is a poor using purely BMI is a poor determinant of how healthy you are. That being said, okay, BMI is very cheap. It's free, actually. You just need, you just need a scales and you need, you, need a, you need a ruler, okay, in order to measure your height. Um, not many of us are rugby players, American football players, or athletes, okay? And broadly speaking, at a population level, the higher your BMI, the more fat you are likely to carry on a population level. So while a poor predictor of individual health, as a uh, marker um, of population health, it is very good because it's cheap. Uh, um, it's, it's a measurement that's not subject to imagination. You weigh something, you, it's, it's empirical. And so it's very good on a population level to track uh, public policy changes, uh, uh, to track health, uh, health um, things, you know, this and that. But from an individual perspective, you need to have a more nuanced look at what, you, at what your health is purely than just your BMI. Okay, and there is a few questions remaining that were about specific kinds of diet and their wider health impact. So there was some questions about what your views were on rapid weight loss, some of, including some of the um, highly restricted calorie programs. And there was also some questions here about um, diets that don't focus on weight loss, that focus instead on healthy living. Okay, so let's deal with the rapid weight loss. So uh, there was a study called the DIRECT study. Okay, and this is the study coming out of Newcastle in which they put type two diabetics on a low calorie kind of shake diet. Okay, I forgot what the 800 calories a day, that's it. So they lost the weight very quickly. So a couple of things there. These shakes were balanced in terms of macronutrient content, so protein, fat, carbs. Um, and what the direct study showed, and then there's now a broader NHS trial that's going out, is that it doesn't matter how you lose the weight, okay? It's not the magical carb thing. But if you manage to lose weight and you are a type 2 diabetic, that a significant percentage of the people that do that will put their diabetes into remission. I'm not going to say reverse because the, the risk factors are always there, but in, in, in remission. So it didn't matter how quickly they lost it. Uh, and it certainly didn't matter how they lost it. The weight loss in of itself, okay, was good enough to put the diabetes into remission. Okay. The problem is not necessarily the speed at which you do it, but how sustainable that is going to be. Now, I think in a trial program where someone is providing you with the shakes and you're motivated, right? Because someone is pinching your tummy and measuring you, you're motivated. I think you'll keep the weight off. What happens when the trial ends, okay? And you've lost now 25 kilos and you're an ex-diabetic and suddenly you go back to the, you go back to the wild west, okay? You are, you are in, you're in the wild doing what you're doing can you keep that weight off? And I think that 
is probably the, the most challenging thing to say. But there's no indication to my mind that the rapidness of weight loss um, is unhealthy. Now, weight con continual yo-yoing at rapid speed, okay, in terms of that, I don't think that's particularly healthy. No. And there was a question. What did you say? There was the... What's uh, a healthy kind of approach to diet? So they'd asked not just about diets to lose weight, but do you have views ah, on healthful yeah, okay. diets so, that aren't weight loss oriented? Yeah. So, so and here I think is going to be the, 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 the key points. I do think um, just two things actually that, that I want to, that I want to bring up. I realize I forgot. So one, one in fact, I'll, I'll give one quick anecdote, uh, uh, one quick point and I'll answer the question. So I guess the, the question to ask is why is it carrying, why is carrying too much fat bad for you? Okay. Let's, let's just deal, deal with, deal with that for, for, for a second. So people misunderstand. Okay. Um, what happens when we gain weight or lose weight? They think that we gain the number of fat cells and we lose fat cells. That's not true. Your fat cells are like balloons, okay? They get bigger when you gain weight. They get smaller when you lose weight. The safest place to store fat happens to be in your fat because that is your professional fat storing or, or organ, okay? The problem is when the fat is not in your cell, fat cells, but then go to your liver and muscle, and that's when you go into disease, okay? So that's the basic, that's the basic premise. Um, the interesting thing is that everyone can store different amounts of fat because of A, how expandable their fat is, and B, where you put your fat. Do you put it in the bum or, or, or the tum? And so different people have different safe fat carrying capacities before the fat goes into their muscle and liver. So famously, South Asian people, Indian, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, East Asian people, people that look like me, cannot get that heavy before we are at risk of type 2 diabetes. Why? We cannot store as much fat as uh, as much fat safely as white people, famously Polynesian people, who are, can get uh, very very large before you actually before you actually um, um, be, be become ill before before your safe fat carrying capacity is breached. So when you're actually looking at health, just your weight is a is a bad marker. You need to know about your safe uh, uh, health, your safe fat carrying capacity. So that's the first, that's just the one piece of information. With regards to weight loss, I think we need to think less about weight and more about health. And if you worry about your health, being active, eating well, your weight will take care of itself. Now, what do I mean by that? The problem is to many people who look in the, look, I wish I looked like Brad Pitt, but it's not going to happen for any number of different reasons. Okay. But when you want to lose weight to be healthy or be healthy and so the weight you are, you may not think you look great because you think you could lose a few more pounds, but that doesn't mean that you're not healthy. So I think we need to think more about health, being active, and then your weight will take care of itself. With that, we've had a question about exercise here of like, with regard to exercise, is HIIT training the best form for weight loss? Is there a particular physical exercise regime that goes along with eating that you have some knowledge about or thoughts about from a geneticist side of things? So I'm not, a, I'm not a, an expert at, at exercise, but undoubtedly they're going to be, um, because of your genes, different responses. So I have colleagues of mine from Norway and from um, um, Sweden who study, for example, um, trainability. So, so, so you know, how quickly your aerobic capacity can improve or how quickly you can change muscle type or how quick, uh, how effective you are at regenerating your glycogen. And all of those are going to differ between people. We know this for a fact because Olympic level athletes have this odd uh, uh, body physiology that allows them to operate at that level, whereas mere mortals like us don't. And so we can take a look at a more subtle variation amongst the population where different people are going to respond to different things. So for some people, hit is great. For other people, they feel, it makes them feel like puking and it's awful. But I think that exercise, no matter how you do it, okay, um, is good for you. Not for weight loss, but it's good for you. So you need to find something that suits you. Uh, um, and for some, it's hit. For others, it's rowing or running or cycling, et cetera, et cetera. We probably need to start wrapping up in a minute, but we do have somebody who's asked kind of the inverse question to what we've been talking about, which is, what if you need to put weight on? How can you do that healthily? Mm -hmm. So so a colleague of mine, um, Sadaf Faruqi, uh, um, Professor Sadaf Faruqi, down at the hospital, she works in the same institute as, as, as I. She also studies severe obesity. I work closely with her. But she also studies congenital leanness. So um, you can be skinny for unhealthy reasons. 
okay, uh, you you could have cancer, you could have HIV. There's there's many there's many different there's many different things that could happen, but um, you can also be skinny because you're skinny, okay. And so as a result, and everyone looks like like stick and sex in your in, in your family, and that's just the way it is. And it's just difficult for you to gain gain weight. There are going to be some people who are congenitally skinny. Okay, and all the weights that they're actually going to do are still going to look. They're still going to look like a high jumper. Will always look like a high jumper, and will never look like a four hundred, a one hundred meter sprinter because they're completely different um, body types and body shapes. And so I think you need to eat more if you're skinny in order to in order to gain the weight. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who's skinny who needs to eat has just showed up. Ah. <laughs> Probably wanting food. Um, so the one thing that we were also asked here that was also raised frequently was about the current anti-diet trend. Is that helpful or is it harmful? The, sorry, the anti-diet trend. And that's sweeping social media. So do you think that that's um, helpful around things like eating disorders and healthful eating? So a lot of things around oh, diet encouraging... I understand what problematic you mean. eating behaviors and especially I know you've mentioned it so I'm going to be a bit cheeky here and say the goop culture of how can you get thinner and thinner and thinner has also led to that counterculture of not body shaming and being anti-diet okay so I think there's a whole complexity of things there I think the eating disorder element is always going to influence a percentage of society. The eating disorders have always been there. They, <clears throat> these days, they have different manifestations. So people who like Instagram, there's now a thing called orthorexia, for example. But it is part of the, it's part of the pathology. I think that 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 puts it that puts it all together. And so, I, I think um, diets are a bad idea for them because they are toxically uh, they people with eating disorders are tox have a toxic a relationship with food, okay, in, in whatever way you want to put that. So I think we have to put that to one side. Now, how about the anti-diet culture, I think, I think in general, and I think that's tied into the body positivity movement and, and, and everything as well. So here's what I do think about this. Um, the problem, it, look, I, there's a huge difference between pointing out a problem. Diet-related illnesses are a problem and blaming the people suffering from the problem. And I think intellectually, we should be able to take those two things apart, okay? We gotta have a problem and we have to solve it. And the way to solve it is to get people to eat less and eat better. That's just no two ways around it. Is this true for everyone? No, but it's true for the vast majority of, of, of people. Um, does this mean that I'm blaming the person? Much of society does blame the person and this is an issue, okay? But does it mean that I blame the person? It doesn't. And I think we gotta have this adult discussion. Some people are, the only way some people are going to be less ill is by eating less and eating better. And some people, not all people. I don't think denying that helps anybody. I think changing the terms of the discussion, changing the tone and tenor of the discussion is how we actually tackle that issue. But some people are going to have to go on a diet in all of its toxic meaning in order to lose weight. And I, I can't magic that away. It's probably a good note to end on. Um, yeah, thank you, Giles, for uh, all the questions. Sorry we can't get to every single question. You're popular. Uh, everyone's, uh, everyone wants to, uh, uh, to pick your brain a little bit. But um, this recording, uh, we had a couple questions about uh, people coming in late. Recording will be online. We'll try to get that up uh, online via Facebook and Twitter and the Jesus College uh, sites on later on this week. Yeah. yeah, so we'll have it put up on the Intellectual Forum's YouTube channel. We'll tweet it out, we'll circulate the social media links, and we will follow up with an email to those of you who registered for the event um, so that you can drop back in. Um, on top of that, Giles, I'm sure as Tyler and I are around this, we're more than happy to receive questions after the fact via Twitter and via other sources to kind of keep the conversation going. All right. It was a pleasure, guys. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming and thank you Giles for your time.